Okay, good afternoon everybody. I think we should um, start now. Very interesting chapter, very interesting subject. I think this subject, like I said, is best discussed, um, as you hopefully will see. There may be um, some video for like both of them, which I'll upload later, but in general, um, there is a lot of interesting issues, which kind of difficult to just uh, talk about without any kind of discussion. Anyway, um, today we'll go over chapter three, which is on um, sophists, sophistic movement, and then on um, Wednesday we'll go over Socrates. But they are related, like um, I told you guys in um, message, and I hope you got this message. I um, hope you will read both chapters, and I hope you started at least in chapter four because it's very interesting. They are related. Um, it's kind of difficult to understand four without three, but then again, four is, um, I guess, more interesting than three because Socrates is everyone's favorite figure. Um, students love Socrates, love talk about Socrates, so it's actually um, something you definitely don't want to miss. But uh, before we go there, let me remind you uh, that MindTap Access, which is, as you hopefully know, free until February 2nd, is... Um, no longer going to be free by uh, the end of day tomorrow february 2nd you should all arrange for some sort of payment and i know most of you did but if you did not make sure that you do because that's when you will lose your free access so they do give you a couple of weeks to sort everything out um, that of course is uh, enough time to um, obtain um, the codes and whatever I know some students may um, have had trouble at the beginning but by now hopefully it's all sorted out in any case after February 2nd um, if you don't sort it out you will lose access to homeworks readings and everything therein uh, of course like I said you don't actually have to have physical book uh, but um, if you did purchase physical book I hope you made sure that it does have access code Okay, um, another thing which I wanted to mention at the beginning, I actually got a message about uh, the review which I sent you guys for the exam. Apparently the end of the review has several matching questions. I somehow overlooked them, they are there twice. Um, I don't know, most students probably didn't notice it yet, but you'll get there, you'll notice. Well, it's obviously not a big deal, right? Um, because while well, the question is twice on the review, uh, that means there's actually fewer questions for you to cover. You don't have to cover it twice. You don't have to prepare for it twice. So in reality, instead of 45, there's like 41 questions. But uh, don't be surprised when you get there. There's like in the very end. Okay, uh, now let's refresh a little bit of what we were talking about before because as always, this is a mini review for the exam and it's also very useful um, for the subject we are going to be talking about today. Now, first of all, again, let's refresh your memory. How would you sum up Heraclitus's view of reality? Yes, everything changes. You cannot uh, walk into the same river twice. Now, in contrast to that, what's the basic claim of Parmenides? What's his view of reality? That was not Parmenides at all. He did not um, even mention water. You are confusing him with Talus. Uh, yeah, change is an illusion. Fire. Huh? His is actually fire. And I agree. Parmenides. No, Parmenides was saying everything is one. Everything is just one thing which never changes. That's the guy. I know there are quite a few of them, so it may be difficult to remember. But these two, like I said, they just contradict each other. So it should be easier to see that. Heraclitus said everything changes. Parmenides says nothing changes. Um, so that that's kind of what we call a contradiction, right? Now, that will be important for several reasons today. Uh, and... Just to, again, give a preview of what's going on. What was the name of the period we covered before 
Does anybody remember? It's actually not in the book, I think, but um, that's the name I actually mentioned uh, when we started lectures last week. No, that's the part where they're coming from. Elia is the part, they're called Eliatics, but the period is called cosmological period. Why is it called cosmological? You can probably figure out. What are they concerned with? Cosmos. They're concerned with cosmological issues. How is um, the world reality is made? Now, what kind of impression did you get from the discussion from uh, all this, uh, everything we covered last week and uh, in general. What's your personal impression of that? Nobody had any impression? There's no wrong answer here. It's just, what do you feel like? Zeno's paradoxes is confusing. Uh, just Zeno's paradoxes, nothing else. Everything else is crystal clear. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is um, surprising. But um, for the most part, it is confusing, isn't it? It's probably what most of you guys feel about the whole thing, not just Zeno's paradoxes. And most people at the time felt just like you did. Uh, they were thinking, okay, well, this great philosopher is saying that everything is made of water. Uh, but that great philosopher is saying everything is made of fire. And then another great philosopher is still contradicts them both. So most people felt just like you guys and thought maybe all of them are wrong. Maybe they have no idea what they're talking about. Do we even care? And so that's basically what gets us to this new uh, period, which we will be covering now and which is known as anthropological period. So the previous one was cosmological. This one we call it anthropological. They themselves didn't call it that, obviously, but we do now that we study this period. Um, how is it different? Instead of studying cosmos in cosmological period, now we are studying anthropos, which is, remember, means man, human being. So instead of being concerned with those issues, what is reality made of, which kind of, well, you can say for the most part, failed because they did not come to any clear conclusion, they switch to um, human issues. The issues which affect all of us, which is also why it may be more interesting to us. And remember, the area which um, deals with it in philosophy is known as ethics. Um, again, at the time, they didn't necessarily call it that, but nonetheless, you will see that this is what they are uh, concerned with. Questions about knowledge and conduct become primary um, specifically how do we deal with life what do we do and so there is like these two lectures we will have this week uh, today on sophists this is five fifth century bc um, and then socrates on wednesday they both are kind of connected um, sophists were more skeptical and practical and socrates is concerned with countering that and trying to find some sort of objective knowledge and objective values. Now, the period itself, the 5th century, is known as a golden age of Greece. 5th century before Christ. Um, that would be, what, about 24, 2500 years ago. In this period, um, Greece itself or Athens in particular, knew their best uh, days. Commercial, intellectual, artistic center of the Greek world, the world theater, for example. We all know what theater is, right? That actually started back then in Greece, and the world itself is Greek. Um, 
Theate means to show something, to watch something. Uh, so that's basically what this world comes from. Medicine, architecture, art, poetry, the greatest sculptures were created around this time. You can see mostly Roman copies of them in most uh, museums of Europe if you ever go to Rome or um, Paris or London, you will see the very few originals survived, but there are Roman copies made a few hundred years later, which we still find enormously valuable. Uh, and the birth of Athenian democracy. Uh, democracy actually started in Athens a little bit before the beginning of the, uh, well, around the beginning of the 5th century, and throughout the 5th century, for the most part, Athens was democratic. Uh, one of the important things about Athens, and remember they had these different uh, governments in different towns. Athens was the one of the biggest at the time, which probably had like uh, uh, 20,000 people or something, which for them was very, very large city. But um, there are many other ones. So what was special about Athens, which became a center of this Greek world, is their democracy actually did not depend on uh, the wealth and did not depend on the noble birth. Prior to 5th century, even in Athens, only uh, people of uh, good birth, people who come from noble families, were running the city. Eupatria, the ones whose fathers were of a good birth. But then they actually introduced a real democracy. They had this Council of 500, which assembly, which was basically uh, selected through all the from all the citizens, even the poor ones, even the poor people were able to sit there and make laws and basically rule the city. So this is um, why we call it the democracy in the first place. Demos, kratos. Um, demos means people. Kratos means power. Power of the people. This is where this word this word comes from. Golden Age of Greece. Great time. However, um, moral disintegration. Throughout the 5th century, um, moral and cultural um, constitution of this society was beginning to crack. It actually, you can see it throughout, it started to deteriorate, especially when um, the Peloponnesian War started. Um, and Thucydides, in his history of Pel Peloponnesian War, describes how things clearly deteriorated at this time. This is closer to the end of the 5th century. He's saying the moral meaning of words was turned about at man's pleasure. The most reckless bravado was deemed the most desirable friend. A man of prudence and moderation was styled a coward. A man who listened to reason was good for nothing simpleton. By the way, does it remind you of anything? Yeah, it is kind of happening um, again. Um, and well, I don't know if you can see culture is cyclical, but there's definitely some similarities because, again, just like Athens was the center of the uh, essentially Western civilization at the time, so today the United States of America is the center of the Western civilization. And just like Athens reached its highest uh, level of development, the United States of America reached its highest level of development. And just like in Athens, um, there were these discussions about um, truth and um, falsity and how public opinion can be bent in a variety of directions. We have exactly the same discussion, so it's actually um, very relevant for us today. Now, what were the reasons um, for this kind of disintegration? Well, the war obviously didn't help, but it, even apart from war, there are several other important reasons. One of them is respect for culture's authorities. Remember the poetic tradition um, and all this tradition regarding multiple gods was declining. Partly philosophers are to blame too, they were criticizing it. So a lot of people um, felt, well, the philosophers are saying, uh, that, you know, those multiple gods perhaps don't even exist. They say maybe there's one god. Well, maybe they are wrong. Maybe there's no god, uh, right? So 
that definitely undermine those um, traditional beliefs. Another reason they, as Greece developed, especially Athens, they started trading more. They had more connections with other cultures. And we will talk about it more uh, a little bit later on. They discovered that there's plenty of people who live completely different lifestyles, who have completely different traditions. And that couldn't help but, uh, you know, raise the questions. Is the way we live the best way? Or are there some better ways to live? Perhaps what we do, the way we do things is not the best one. It's just one of many. Uh, and that in itself, of course, also began to undermine the value of whatever culture they themselves had. Number three, uh, the reason number three for this deterioration, rise of democratic lawmaking. Uh, there is definitely this flip side to democracy that when uh, people themselves govern, the questions begin to be raised. Uh, well, why are these people govern and no, not the other ones? Uh, what right do they have to decide for everybody? We have similar questions today, right? Uh, like, why are these people in Washington? Why are not some other people in Washington? Um, who are they to decide for all of us? And note that if you um, claim that um, whoever is in charge has some sort of divine power or whatever, God decided that he should be the king or she should be the queen or something like that, then, of course, um, that helps a little. Regular people can say, okay, well, if God decided, um, who are we to question that? But if you have democratic uh, rule of uh, in the government, then that is no longer working. And you may just equally ask, like, why uh, is this guy the president? Why is not the other guy the president? Yes, I know we voted, but I don't like him nonetheless. And I don't want him to be the president nonetheless. So... Note that it actually is very difficult to um, get everybody to agree to accept um, a particular person in charge. Of course, we in this country have constitution, we do things according to the law, and it worked pretty well for a couple of hundred years. But note that now even that is again being questioned. And people are saying, well, maybe there was some sort of mass fraud, right? And tried to prove to me that there wasn't. And so that kind of a um, similar situation um, was present in Athens and by the way in case if you're curious that did kind of lead to the demise of democracy they have had tyranny for uh, a period of time then they tried to restore democracy again because they discovered tyranny is even worse um, so I hope we're not heading in this direction but nonetheless and finally the plurality of opinions including among philosophers just like we talked about um, they all contradict each other on all these issues, right? People listen to them and then they say, okay, this guy says uh, there are multiple gods. This guy says there's one god. This guy says we should do things this way. Uh, this guy says we should do things the other way. Maybe they're all idiots. Maybe none of them knows um, anything. So that kind of undermined uh, trust in any kind of institutions, including religious, political, and so on. Now, this is where sophists actually uh, step in. Um, most people began more cynical. They uh, began more interested in kind of a practical approach rather than metaphysical approach. Instead of wondering about this one true reality, they um, just started wondering about, well, okay, how can I personally succeed and get what I want? Uh, which, again, has a lot of similarity to the way we um, run things today, isn't it? People started wondering, like, how can I take advantage of this whole thing and perhaps become wealthy and uh, become um, powerful myself? And um, I shouldn't even care about the gods. Maybe there is, maybe there are gods, maybe there are no gods. Who cares? Um, I am here today. I want to be rich and powerful. That's what most people um, felt like. Perhaps not everybody, but this was a common um, factor. And so sophists were kind of a, this professional um, teachers of wisdom. Uh, 
traditionally the Greeks had some sort of education, um, but it was rather basic. Most of them were taught uh, simple things to read, to write, uh, perhaps to do some simple calculations, and that's about it. Um, Sophists were kind of offering special tutorials on top of that. And wealthy people or people who had money could hire them for their children, mostly for their children, for their young, in order to um, give them better chance in life. Note that there were already plenty of people who were wealthy, but who were not well born. They were not noble in a sense like, you know, aristocrats. Um, so for this reason, they obviously, while they had money, they did not have this kind of political influence as they would want to. But they were trying to use this money in order to give their children a better education so their children could have it. And in democracy in general, it was very, very um, good to be able to speak well. Why? Well, they actually had a very direct type of democracy. Many questions they were deciding, um, just huge gathering of people. Um, they did not have internet, obviously. So they would just gather on Agora, uh, this large market square in Athens or whatever other places. And some people will speak and try to convince them one way and other people will speak and try to convince them the other way. And based on that, they were making decisions. Uh, so it was extremely important to be able to speak well. The word sophists actually has the same root as the word sophos. Uh, it comes from the word sophia, which is wisdom. So sophistes is actually um, derived from the word sophos in the same um, way as there is another uh, kifara, uh, which is traditional instrument. So the person who plays kifara is kifaristes. Uh, so, similarly, who is sophistes is the person who practices wisdom, Sophia. Um, it did not have any bad connotation at first. It slowly became more uh, of a negative word after the quarrels with Socrates in particular, which we mainly talk about next time, but you hopefully will also see what uh, specific reasons there were for people to kind of get suspicious about sophists. Um, they were offering this kind of private education, type of a mix of what we today would say is, uh, if you take philosophy 102, psychology 101, and communication 101 classes, right? So essentially, philosophy 102 would teach you the art of arguments, how do you uh, present your ideas in a clear way, and they did that among other things, psychology 101, well, obviously, how is human psychology works? How can you, for example, convince people uh, if you want? And finally, communications in particular, how do you make speeches? How do you talk to people? How do you uh, use those skills you learned about arguments and uh, psychology in practical way to convince people to do what you want? By the way, it was also very useful in a court of law at the time because, um, again, as we will see next time um, on an example of the trial of Socrates, um, the, the way they were running law, uh, the courts of justice, was also very democratic. They had a jury of 500 people, insane amount of people, and um, the accused would actually, he did not have any lawyers, he would speak for them himself um, to defend himself, and the accuser again would himself be a prosecutor. So they would just meet, uh, this jury would listen to both sides, and then decide, first of all, whether uh, the person accused is guilty or not, and second of all, whether or not, uh, which kind of punishment this person deserves. So as you can imagine, being able to speak well was also very valuable for this reason. Now, um, the figure of um, Protagoras. Protagoras is actually um, discussed in the book. He is one of the probably oldest and the most well-known um, sophists. An interesting figure. Um, the book calls him archetypal sophist. So he's like this, um, an example of a sophist, which we can look at. Um, there were quite a few of them, but 
he is very good candidate for this um, active traveler he was traveling a lot most of them traveled a lot this is part of their um, occupation actually because they were offering this private lessons it made sense for them to move from town to town because they would come to town first they would hold some sort of public meeting to present their skills to show people that what they are capable of and then a bunch of wealthy people would hire them and they would give lessons to their children and then they would move to another town and do the same thing and so on um, so they also had a very good knowledge of different cultures um, were able to compare them now one of the interesting things which they were in particular teaching and uh, when we talk about Protagoras we should mention is anti-logic anti-logic what is that you think like um, it would be something completely opposed to logic well it's not exactly that anti-logic is just a method of two arguments for and against any subject so essentially the idea here is you must be able to argue both for and against anything that kind of um, helps first of all helps you to develop your uh, rhetorical skills to be able to convince other people but uh, not only that it also is uh, you know helpful in order for you if you want to pick one of these either for or against to convince uh, people in terms of uh, whatever it is you want to achieve so Protagoras was the first to declare that there are two mutually opposed arguments on any subject this is what we know from um, Diogenes from his famous book lives of the philosophers and he says so and we kind of trust him on that so before that I guess nobody really thought about it in this way but nonetheless it is true you can argue uh, for and against almost anything which you can again could hopefully see in today's politics right people argue uh, for uh, guns and against guns um, that's one example for uh, free medicine for all and against free medicine for all note that that is a very good example of anti-logic strictly speaking anybody if you want to could like successfully argue both points of view like one of them would probably be closer to your own um, attitude but nonetheless you can see how people argue for another one and it's actually a pretty good exercise if you ever want to um, learn a little bit about art of rhetoric and how it works now um, anti-logic itself is not necessarily a bad thing nonetheless um, they were accused because of that in particular by Socrates um, in making uh, the weaker argument stronger so essentially what the charge here is 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 that you know sometimes um, instead of being on the side of the truth uh, if you have this rhetorical skill you can successfully uh, just argue what is a false view but um, just because you'll benefit from it right not everybody um, is honest enough to um, always pursue the truth so many people including Socrates were saying sophists are actually when they teach people to do that when they give them this ability are doing disservice to the society because some people will use it well but other people will use it badly they will use it in order to um, you know push their point of view um, in order to benefit themselves like you may for example say again uh, going to current events um, say uh, the weapons right the, the, the uh, whether or not Americans should have weapons many people argue they should because of the um, Second Amendment and so on but some people are saying well but know that um, NRA benefits from it greatly um, so the way they argue for that is that really like that what they believe in or is that something which is just beneficial for them because there are millions of dollars of profit in um, selling guns right so if you stop doing that then of course uh, lots of people will lose a lot of money um, that, that that is still a very relevant question so the accusation was again this is a couple of quotes from ancient sources which we have Protagoras made the weaker and, and stronger arguments and taught his students to blame and praise the same person 
This is making the weaker argument stronger. People who are rightly annoyed at Protagoras', Protagoras is prompt promise so essentially what they are saying is that he was specifically teaching his students to be able to argue both sides so if you're able to argue both sides then of course you're also able to pick the one which is not the right one but the one which is more advantageous okay let's discuss it now because um, you may get too bored if we don't break a little bit um, now, we do similar things in a court of law in this country, right? So should we be arguing for both sides in a court of law? Do you think it's a good practice to do it? Because note that this is exactly how court of law actually operates. Um, the defense attorney never questions uh, the guilt of his client. That's not their job. Their job is to actually try and prove their client is innocent. But um, the prosecutor, on the other hand, doesn't assume that they are innocent they actually try to um, argue for um, the guilt again and do their best to convince us so what do you think should we be doing that okay so uh, one opinion is that we should vote for both sides it allows for different viewpoints that one side might not have all. But note that um, what, are, what are the dangers there? Like, is it even ethical? Think about it from the point of view of defense attorney. Uh, defense attorney has to do his best defending all sorts of really horrible individuals. Um, some of them are murderers, rapists, um, and so on. Um, we can even see sometimes that people get are very mad at them because even though they're doing their job but um, like in particular how how much should they do note uh, the famous example of OJ Simpson trial most of you guys probably didn't see it I actually watched it live back then and uh, it was quite a show and note that you probably know the outcome right they actually got him off um, the lawyers did their job so well that he got off, even though it really seems that he is guilty of murder. So, isn't there a problem there? Do we all know right from wrong? Now, murder is obviously a wrong thing to do. Um, so, would we say that the outcome of this trial was just? Yes, and there were, of course, people who were prosecuted even though they were innocent. Um, so, now note that it actually does come down to, again, money and who has the best money. So, lawyers in this case are a bit like sophists. Um, the person with money, like O.J. Simpson, pays them, I don't know, what did he pay, $10 million or something, a lot of money, and of course he gets off. But note that the other person who may have no money at all gets some sort of public defender who um, doesn't do anything, pretty much, and then he goes to jail for the murder he did not even commit. Um, is that fair in any way? Where's fairness? Well, it becomes somewhat of a matter who tells the best story. Well, there, there are two issues there, right? Um, the trial not deciding what is right or wrong. Well, in a way it does, because um, not the juries very often vote with their hearts rather than with the facts, which is why um, we even have the jury, because the judge himself could decide purely on the facts. Uh, and sometimes, like, you know, people waive the jury trial, but uh, the jury is regular folks, just like all of us. Which is also why um, good lawyers exploit it and they try to work on the jury. First of all, the selection of the jury itself is obviously a big part of the trial. When both sides try to select the jury they think will be more sympathetic to their point of view. Um, and then uh, they try to work on them throughout the trial with all the psychological tricks. And again, O.J. Simpson is an exactly example when it worked. They raised the issue of racism. Um, it was true that the leading detective in this case was a racist. They showed 
uh, proof of that. And then they successfully argued that since police is racist, uh, there is a very good chance they planted the evidence. And note that in a murder trial, all you need is to raise reasonable doubt. And the jury said, well, we have reasonable doubt here. Maybe police did plant this evidence, and so he walked free. Yeah, they tried to convince the jury. So the art of speaking is the most important art for them too. Uh, it's not uh, for the lawyers so much the truth which is at issue. Note that a defense lawyer does not go into the trial thinking, I should defend the truth. He goes into the trial thinking, I should get my client off, um, no matter what the truth is. And equally, the prosecutor is not thinking, I should get to the truth. He's thinking I should get him convicted, no matter what the truth is. And we are hoping that as a result of that, the truth will somehow come out. But does it actually come out? Well, hopefully more often than not, but clearly not always. So this is one of the examples where um, sophists also were very active and clearly a connection with present days um, still is there. So let's look at some of the other stuff because there's still a lot of interesting um, issues here. So Protagoras is famous for his assertion, man is the measure of all things. This is what he uh, said. Man is the measure of all things, so those that are, that they are, of those that are not, that they are not. Now, we don't know exactly what he meant because um, that can be interpreted in several ways. Know that, first of all, man, what is he talking? Is he talking about like one man, each one man, like I am a measure of all things and I measure them one way, but you are a, a different person, so you measure it in a different way? Or is he talking about man as in like humankind, like all of us, right? Um, well, we don't know for a fact, but um, it, either one uh, is possible. So like all men together, when they uh, have an opinion about something, that's what decides what something is. Note that, of course, it's a different way to look at it. Um, measure of all things. What all things? That's another thing. Like, what all things is he talking about? Is he, is he just talking about matters of opinion, such as what is, you know, tasty, what is um, uh, uh, hot or cold? Or is he also talking about such things as whether something happened or not? Like, um, did the murder take place? Do we as men just decide on that or is that actually something which um, definitely is there regardless of men? So that is even possible that the, he could mean this because as you will see later on in this class, there is some philosophers who successfully argue that the entire reality is the result of our mental um, process, the immaterialism. So in that case, you can say, well, uh, whether the murder even took place is completely uh, the result of our, you know, ideas. There really is no reality per se. There's no reality uh, anywhere. It's just our perception of it. So we don't know exactly what he meant, but it obviously um, raises this important question about um, how much does man in particular or man as a total even uh, have a say about all that? Um, do we really influence things? So this is a, what is known as relativism. And the book actually distinguishes two types of relativism, cultural relativism and individual relativism. So what is cultural relativism? It is the belief that all values are culturally determined. So if this culture in particular uh, finds certain things to be acceptable, then it's good for this culture. And another culture, if it finds different things to be acceptable, then it is good for that other culture. And even though they are different, um, each one of them is right, right? So there's no like right or wrong. However, note that in this case, it's the culture, it's not one person. But individual relativism is stronger than that. It basically says that um, every person decides um, what is right and wrong. Every, each and every one of us, we can just decide it for ourselves. And this is, of course, a stronger kind of a, a claim. Now, this is an interesting quote um, from Plato um, on the subject. 
kind of a little bit long, but I, I think this is an important chunk uh, of information. So this comes from the um, dialogue called Tetatus. We will talk about Plato next week, but Plato is the main source of information about sophists, about Socrates and so on, because we have the entirety of his dialogues preserved uh, and we know exactly what he was saying. And he lived at that time. So what is he saying? Um, remember the sorts of thing you were saying before. To a sick man, what he eats appears as is bitter, whereas to a healthy man, it appears the opposite. Now, what must be done isn't to make either of them wiser, because that isn't even possible. Nor is it to accuse the sick one of being ignorant, because he makes the sort of judgment he does and calls the healthy one wise, because he makes judgments of a different sort. What must be done is to effect a change in one direction, because one of the two conditions is better. In education, too, in the same way, a change must be effected from one of two conditions to the better one. But whereas a doctor makes the change with drugs, a sophist does, does it with the things he says. So this is essentially what Protagoras was saying. Note that the idea here is this. There's really no, um, no such thing as true and false. But there are better things and worse things. So if a sick person disagrees with you about the taste of something um, and you disagree with the sick person about the taste of something, naturally neither one of you is right or wrong, but you would think that, you know, it's not good to be sick, right? So the idea is not to make the healthy person sick so they would agree on that. The idea is you should make sick person healthy and then they will agree on that. Similarly in education, there's no such thing as true education and false education. But there's education which works, which kind of makes your life better. And there's education which doesn't work, which makes your life more miserable. So it is more of a practical approach. Um, and this is known as pragmatism. What is pragmatism? Pragma in Greek means deed or something done. So that's exactly where this word comes from, pragmatism. Idea, ideas have meaning or truth value to the extent that they produce practical results and effectively further our aims. We will talk about American pragmatism in the end of class, but this is like basically an introduction to this uh, approach. If you did homework, and I hope you did homework, um, it actually did talk about um, different uh, theories of truth. Well, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But one of them is based on pragmatic approach. So pragmatism, again, is the idea that nothing is really true or false in itself. Nonetheless, certain things work better for us than other things. So for this uh, reason, for example, if you want to get healthy, you're not going to be listening to your neighbor Joe, you're going to be listening to a medical doctor. Why? Well, can he be wrong? Of course he can be wrong, but his opinion is way better than the opinion of your neighbor Joe, uh, who may be a very nice guy, but he did not study medicine for many years, and this guy did, right? So even though each one of them has an opinion and each one of them can be wrong, these opinions are not on equal measure. And how do we know that? Because of the result. Because if you listen to your neighbor Joe, it's, there's much better chances that you will get even sicker and maybe even die. But if you listen to the medical doctor, even though there's still a chance that you might get sicker and die, and it does happen, this chance is not uh, as big. Um, and there's much better chance that you will recover and you will feel much better and you live long and healthy life. And certainly, based on that, um, one of them is better than the other. So this is kind of this pragmatic approach. Now, um, Socrates, as we will talk about next time, makes somewhat of a stronger statement. He rejects uh, relativism completely. He rejects this idea that man is the measure of all things because he's saying there are certainly some things which man is the measure of. So, for example, whether this... Uh, dish tastes good or bad. Well, of course, it is um, something anyone can decide. Nonetheless, he thinks that there are, there are certain things which are um, good and they come from the good, right? And we'll talk about it next time more in depth. So 
He's saying there's actually such thing as the truth. And there's actually such thing as the good, uh, which you can also associate with God, right? So that is kind of like the standard. And man by um, itself or even by themselves as a society do not determine these things. These things are kind of already there. Um, so this is the three theories of truth which are known in philosophy and like I said you probably saw them on the first homework um, the first one is correspondence theory of truth correspondence theory of truth is probably what most people think about when they talk about the truth so it basically says that statement is true if it corresponds to the facts at hand so to say something is true literally means that if I say it is true that uh, there's a cat in this box in front of me what I mean is there's actually an animal cat inside that box and everything in the world can be judged by this standard now there is actually another theory of truth and we will talk about it more when we make it to Hegel um, known as coherence coherence theory of truth what is a coherence theory of truth the coherence theory of truth says that basically the statement is true when it coheres or fits into the overall network of your existing beliefs so Know that it's not as strong in a sense that things don't necessarily have to be true by some outside standard. But um, they have to fit together. So all your beliefs must work together nicely. And if they work together nicely, that means they are true. But if they kind of contradict each other, if there is a, a particular problem as a result of your beliefs, then they are not true. And this is the best we can do in life because we can never know reality as it is in itself in order to um, get to the correspondence theory of truth. We can only have more or less consistent beliefs, right? So um, the coherence of your beliefs will be checked constantly throughout your life because if you hold a belief which is incoherent, then it will sooner or later uh, get you into some sort of trouble. And this, from this pragmatic theory of truth emerged, uh, which is just basically builds on that. So it says that, first of all, A, um, yes, the statement is true if it fits into a network of your beliefs, but not just that. It takes it a little bit further and it says, and it allows you to function better on a practical level. So this is not what Protagoras was saying. So there's no such thing as the truth. But there are certainly things which are truer than some other things. And how can we check that? Well, first of all, we can check whether it you know, works with all your other beliefs. Because if it doesn't, that's already a problem. But even if it works with your other beliefs, you can um, still judge some of them better than others if it works for you and makes your life happier. Because essentially the idea is to be happy. Okay. Okay. Um, in addition to that, um, Socrates in Plato criticizes relativism for this reason. I did mention it before. He's saying, in the end of the day, relativism is just um, a complete contradiction. It is in itself a contradiction. What does he mean? Well, let's actually do this on the board. So I can explain it to you a little bit better in case if you are uh, confused. How is it a contradiction? Let's say there are two beliefs. The relativist says everything relative, all opinions equal. This is belief A. Okay, um, and let's say you are saying no, they are not equal. Note that um, if relativism is relativist telling you that all opinions are equal, he must accept your opinion. Because that's just one of the opinions, right? So according to his idea, your opinion is right. So that is what the self how it is self-defeating. Do you see what it means? This opinion itself tells you 
that you are right. Because your opinion is also an opinion. And so it is right. And that involves a contradiction because um, how can he then even argue? How can he even then say that he is more right than you? He can't. By definition, he cannot do that. Uh, by definition, he must admit that you are right. Well, essentially, yeah, but note that if there are two right opinions, that means that neither of them is right, and then the person who says there are two right opinions kind of indeed defeats himself. Uh, he has to uh, try to argue that he is right and you are wrong. That, that, that's, what, that, that's what an argument is. If he accepts your opinion that um, there are no, um, not all opinions are equal, then he defeats himself immediately. But if he doesn't accept your opinion, then he can't argue anymore that all opinions are equal. So that is what um, 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 Plato is um, saying in um, Theotetus. Well, uh, it's about all opinion, but right? Let's say this person who says all opinions are equal uh, would be arguing that um, murder is right. He has to immediately say that since it's his opinion, it's equally right that the murder is wrong. Right? Because all opinions are equal. He cannot say that his opinion that murder is right is any better than the opinion that the murder is wrong. But in this case, uh, it's not about the murder. It's about the opinion that the opinion is equal to another opinion. And so when it turns around to opinion, that becomes complete nonsense because you no longer can say it. The, the only way to get out of it is to say, okay, all opinions are equal except this one. This one is not. This, this one is actually the correct one. Well, that still would involve the contradiction because you can't pick the other one. All opinions are equal then you can pick and choose, but you cannot pick the opinion that they are not equal. Because if you pick the opinion that they are not equal, then you are defeating uh, the argument that they are all equal. Okay, now um, Fusis and Nomos. This is kind of a big uh, thing also in um, ancient Greece, and an interesting um, discussion will follow from that too. What is Fusis and Nomos? So these are two Greek terms. Fusis we already talked about, right? Um, Fusis commonly commonly translated as nature. It basically means um, the world which is independent of human tradition and decision. So we can say that by Fusis we all have to breathe air, for example. By Fusis we all have to die. Now nomos uh, comes from Greek uh, word, they both come from Greek words uh, for law, uh, and it basically is customs and convention, human-made kind of uh, laws. So there was a big divide about them. Uh, and this is a good quote, which I wanted to read to you guys, um, which again illustrates a little bit of what we talked about before. It comes from Herodotus. And Herodotus says, when Darius uh, was king of the Persian Empire, he summoned the Greeks who were at his court and asked how much money it would take for them to eat the corpses of their fathers. Uh, they responded that they would not do it for any price. The Greeks were actually um, burning their dead. So afterwards, Darius summoned some Indians uh, called Kalatai, who do eat their parents. And this is their tradition, right? They actually eat their, as insane as it may seem to us, and it probably seemed insane to the Greeks, but they do. They, they think that it is a good way to honor their parents after they die to eat them. So he gathered them and to ask them um, in the presence of the Greeks who understood through interpreters for what price they would agree to cremate their dead fathers. They cried out loudly, loudly and told him to keep still. That is what people's customs are. And I think Pindar was right when he wrote that Nomos is king of all. So that kind of a, a illustration of this discussion, right? Um, which way to honor the dead is the correct one? One culture burns your dead. 
the other culture well in this case eats uh, their dead parents today nobody eats their dead parents but note that we still have different approaches like some cultures still burn their dead uh, like in india uh, other cultures bury them in the ground and so on which way is the right way is there such thing as the right way to do it and note that this is the question between fuzis and nomos so fuzis um, is the idea that there is one natural way to do it uh, but nomos is the approach by the different culture different laws um, now there's another good term which the book mentions ethnocentrism it comes from the again greek root meaning the race is at the center ethnos the race is at the center it's the belief that customs and beliefs of one's own culture are inherently superior to all others right so ethnocentrism is saying that our culture does it the right way and all the other cultures are just doing it completely wrong uh, the god speaks our language looks like us and is our color uh, our family practices the natural others deviant everybody else at greeks called barbaroi which is where the word barbarian comes from barbaroi they were uh, making fun of other people of other cultures saying that the way they speak is like barbar 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 bar. so that's why they call them barbaroi uh, the people who speak incoherently but the greek language is the language okay let's discuss this can you think of any ways we americans are ethnocentric is there close parallel between uh, athens of the fifth century and america today in that sense what do you guys think are we ethnocentric in any way yes because we say all the time that america is the best country and that we're the most developed okay um, we do say that don't we um, well not maybe not all of us but certainly some people um, is it true do you think america is the best country like what is the best country is there such thing as the best country Well, yeah, just an opinion, but I mean, is it a true opinion? <laughs> so when you say it is just an opinion, you basically are saying that it, it cannot be true. There's no such thing as true opinion. Or are you saying that um, it could never be true? Okay, but in theory shouldn't there be better ways to run the country and worse ways to run the country so note that you may um, make this kind of a somewhat softer statement that america is not ideal country but it is the best one of we, what we have by the way this is a famous um, there's a famous saying by um, um, british prime minister um, churchill and churchill was saying democracy is a horrible way to run a country but it's the best one we know so that's the same idea um yeah it's pretty bad but there's nothing better than that the rest is even worse but are we ethnocentric do you see um us saying in particular that certain features of american life are definitely better than the way other countries do this stuff if you watch TikTok, there's very many videos on that subject. I sometimes um, um, do look there, and like it is very amusing um, how there's even a, this kind of a one feature when they ask uh, foreigners to describe uh, the most outrageous things Americans ever told them, and there's plenty of interesting <laughs> videos on that subject. Did you guys notice that? So this is again a kind of a current debate we have today isn't it about the american way of life is it already the best because note that uh, there's this rather common conservative opinion that uh, it is great we should never change that 
because um, if we start changing that, it will get worse. And then, like very um, common criticism of what is happening today in this country is we're moving towards socialism, right? Uh, and that is bad. We don't want that. We want things the way they were before. Make America great again, the way it was back in the yesteryears. Uh, and if we're going to be moving towards socialism, it will no longer be great. So do you think it's et ethnocentrism? We well, are yeah, um, a Korean said that there was no such thing as mixed Koreans and we shouldn't sully their great culture and history. Is this similar to ethnocentrism? Well, what do you guys think? It sounds um, definitely somewhat ethnocentric. Um, now, do we have a right to criticize other countries? There's definitely uh, some areas when um, you must be able to. I mean, let's take an extreme example, right? Uh, let's look at Nazi Germany. They were burning uh, Jewish people in uh, concentration camps. They were burning them, literally destroying them. Can we say, oh, it's your culture. I mean, you decided to do that. Who are we to criticize? Would that be the right approach? I mean, there definitely seems something wrong about that. So there obviously are some areas when you can say, okay, <laughs> that... <laughs> You may think it's your culture, but you know what? It, it's completely wrong. Uh, ethnocentrism is just basically saying whatever we do is the only correct way. And that note is different from like saying, okay, there are other different ways to organize things, but there are limits to what other cultures can and cannot do before they step over the line, right? Um, well, the, it all involves factual events. I mean, the way they um, cremate their dead too is a factual event. I mean, note that you cannot argue that uh, um, it doesn't happen. It obviously happens. So if they certain culture eats their dead after they um, have died, that is a fact. Now, whether or not it's a good idea to do that, now that's a different question. There's many, many of also um, those TikToks about um, English language and how people are accusing other uh, ethnicities of not being able to understand English. That's actually true. If you travel around the world, you will very often see Americans um, like really being um, um, certain that everybody should speak English. And French people are especially offended by this, but many other countries too. And um, um, they make making fun of Americans who like when they say something and they see how the person doesn't understand, think that if they repeat the same thing louder next time, it will somehow will become more clear. <laughs> so that that's one of the features of um, this American ethnocentrism. Well, but they know that the, the Nazis could argue with you that the fact that they were burning Jews was also right. Uh, and they did. And what were the arguments they were presenting? They were saying that the Jews actually is a horrible, horrible type of people and that they are destroying German nation. So the German people are suffering because of that. So they had every right to get rid of them. Nobody was saying there with it. Nobody in their right mind would do something uh, evil and say, yeah, it's evil. I'm just enjoying that. If a person does that, they, that means they are completely insane. But they, the Nazis were not insane. They had their own reasoning. We can say it was completely wrong, of course, and we do say that. But they themselves thought it was right. And they would argue with you if, uh, of course, they were not defeated during the World War II and try to convince you that they are right because they have all this evidence. I mean, look at the evidence. Jews are all bankers. Um, they control everything and so on. This is the actual arguments they were making. So... Um, if you say everything is a matter of opinion, that's their opinion. Is it as good as yours? Well, we can say that, but I mean, they, they would again disagree. They would say, you don't have a soul. We have a very nice soul, <laughs> German soul, and that's the best one. That's where Nazism comes from, right? It's all for the German people. It's a great uh, uh, idea 
for the German nation. One um, country, one Führer, um, and we are trying to dominate everybody. And that kind of brings us to our next topic too. Um, so it does kind of go there slowly. This is enormous. Um, sophists were agreeing that traditional morality is based on nomos. So the way we look at things, what is right and what is wrong, is not by nature. When we say you shouldn't do certain things um, like murder, um, it's not because there is some sort of law of nature which prohibits murder. It's because you don't want to be murdered, right? And you don't want um, your loved ones to be murdered. So you just conventionally decide that it should not be done. But there's no like higher power or higher um, authority on that. So this is kind of like this, you may say, um, rather modern outlook uh, that the society is built on, again, this practical type of approach. Um, the society decided that we shouldn't murder each other because it's just not nice to live in a society when people murder each other. But nonetheless, that is just conventional. This is just something we decided on. Conventional morality. Um, and that kind of brings us to this other person, Antiphon. Antiphon was another sophist. Um, but he was basically saying he was all on the side of Fusis, on the side of nature. And he was saying, well, um, the laws of society, the nomos, is very often in, in tension with the laws of nature, with the Fusis. And we actually are better off following nature. Because nature, uh, you can't argue with nature. That's how nature set up things. So by nature, we enjoy certain things. They make it pleasant for us. And by nature, we do not enjoy other things. They make it painful. So of course, we should pursue pleasure and avoid pain. But society very often doesn't let us do this. So he was saying, um, again, this practical kind of approach, a man will be just then in a way most advantageous to himself, if in the presence of witnesses he holds the laws of the city, or nomoi, in high esteem, but in the absence of witnesses, when he is alone, those of nature, or fusis. So what is he saying? He's saying, well, when others can see you, or can catch you, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't uh, kill anybody, you shouldn't do any of those things, because the law will punish you. But just between us, you know, uh, when you have a chance to get away with it, you certainly should do whatever it is you find pleasant. And if it's pleasant for you to steal something, but be my guest, by all means, um, steal it. Um, so uh, essentially, this is where this idea of uh, might make right comes from. And um, again, the chapter does talk about it. And it is a what we can call moral realism. It's in contrast to Protagoras, um, comes from this next generation of sophists, such as Antiphon, first of all, and then Callicles. Callicles is the next one mentioned in, in the book. So, might make rise right. Whoever uh, wins is the right person. Whoever is the strongest is the right person. Some People are superior by nature, by fusis, and they are the better people because they are stronger. Nomas, on the other hand, the laws of society is just a conspiracy of the weak against the strong. So that's what um, Callicles is actually arguing for in um, uh, one of Plato's dialogues. He's saying the majority of the people are just weak, um, and this weak majority establishes nomoi which declare it unjust and shameful to have a larger share. So, for example, they come up with progressive taxes and stuff like this. So what they could take away from the people who are stronger, stuff which they themselves cannot um, achieve. They are willing to settle for equal shares for all, for they see that in this way they will have more than um, they would if the strong were allowed to pursue their advantage. So, again, essentially, this is a very current debate, isn't it? It's a debate about socialism. Because what's the idea behind socialism? That the rich uh, people should share with the poor people. That the rich people have this unfair advantage by being rich. So, in this case, the argument is more of like 
this, you would say, conservative argument. Um, and the argument is this. Some people are just more capable. They work harder, they are more able, and that's why they have more. And other people who are lazy and, um, you know, not really able to do anything, they can't win in any other way, but because it's a democracy, they vote so that um, the politicians who they vote for could take it from those stronger people who are able to um, create jobs and so on and give it to those lazy people. So that's, that's the same idea. And um, back then, um, 2,500 years ago, they um, were also concerned with it. Um, the power itself is the ultimate value. Superior and powerful individual has natural right to dominate others, right? Based on Fuzis. He is better because he is stronger. Uh, all people are no more created equal than animals are. And look at the animal kingdom. Again, this is the Fuzis, right? This is how the animal kingdom works. If one animal is stronger than the other one, is he going to share with him? No, he'll just take it. He may even kill this other animal. And they do all the time. So, uh, for to suffer wrong is not the part of man at all, but that of a slave for whom it is better to be dead than alive. And it is for anyone who is unable to come either to his own assistance uh, when he is wronged or mistreated or to that of anyone who cares about. So, essentially, again, the idea is that um, poor people, people who don't have anything, they don't deserve any better because they're slaves to begin with. Uh, so that is, of course, um, again, like not just something they were discussing back then. This is something we discuss today in our society. Um, Fusis or nomos? In this case, it's kind of a mix, right? Nomos of Fusis. So the law of society should reflect these laws of nature. They should be based on the law of nature. And what's the law of nature? The strongest wins. The, those who are most capable get everything and those who are not give, get nothing. And that's fair. That's how things should actually work. Um, in this case, the successful life or life of Greeks called it arete. Um, and we'll talk more about arete next time. Uh, but that basically is um, excellence. The excellence of uh, the person and happiness of the person is a life spent in unundulated satisfaction of one's desires. So when you have the biggest car, the biggest house, the biggest everything, when you have the power over other people, that means you're successful. That means you got it all. And that is, again, living by fuzis, living by nature. Okay, so let's discuss this part before we wrap up for today. Um, is some part of you stirred up by all this talk of superiority? Like, I mean, obviously that does seem like um, something very, very um, obnoxious to most people, isn't it? What do you guys think? What's wrong with this? What do you think is wrong with this point of view? Is it appealing? But clearly is appealing to many people, right? Uh, we know, again, in this country, that's one of the reasons why people, we don't want socialism, because socialism is to take it from those who can and give it to those who are not able to. But what specifically is wrong with this? Can you point at something there? Well, but they're saying abuse of power is actually great. There's no such thing. If the person has power, it means he deserves to have power. And if he deserves to have power, then he, by all means, should be able to abuse it. Too bad for you that you don't have power. Now, first of all, let's look at whether there is something uh, true about that. Because um, even under socialism, people who work harder and who are more capable were rewarded better, right? Uh, I mean, nobody in their right mind would ever say that there should not be a different reward to people who 
have work and who people who don't do anything and indeed are just you know lounging on their couch um, but what is fundamentally wrong with this approach well you may not want to have power but maybe you want to have money don't you want to have money how many people don't want to have money raise your hands okay well th there's one argument which can be made against it and this is uh, probably the most powerful argument note that um, if you had um, some sort of a society of uh, I don't know 30 year olds who already are fully formed individuals um, you could possibly say that um, strongest one there and most capable ones should indeed have better share but what is the problem with the actual society such as the one we have the problem is that people are not born 30 year old are they they born how many year old zero year old right and um, the time they are born they have no power they have no decision making power do they um, did, did anybody any of you guys um, make decisions when you were like one year old how many decisions have you made probably zero right um, so how about two-year-old no still no decisions three-year-old no what time at what age you actually are capable of making meaningful decisions about your life well it's obviously hard to say but i would say maybe 13 14 as the earliest but no that by then your life is almost set on a particular course your parents decided for you where you live your parents decided for you what school you go to your parents decided for you almost everything right so suppose your parents are billionaires and they gave you the best education and they live in a fantastic neighborhood um, so what are the chances you'll be successful in life then pretty good don't you think you still can of course um, ruin it but it would take some effort it's actually not that easy now let's look at another situation somebody born in a ghetto his parents are drug addicts he grows up around him all the gangs the gangsters he goes to the worst school now by age of 13 he or she may already have criminal record what are the chances of that person succeeding in life so you see where the problem is um, by the time we actually are capable of making decisions it may be too late to make any decisions so while it is true that for a grown individual we should indeed um, give uh, him or her all the um, credit for being strong but for most people um, that's not the case for most people it's about who you were born where you were born and how your life started um, it's not even your choice there's nothing literally nothing you can do about it and so in a society where many people live in a ghetto you will have many people who fail just based on that not because they're lazy but because there's just nothing they can do um, that is indeed not in their power to raise over um, their head and that's that's one of the arguments against it okay so we're running out of time for today um, for the next time we will talk about um, Socrates like I said it's a very interesting figure and we will continue on the issue of justice because there's quite a few things Socrates has to say about that too and we will see uh, what was Socrates's position and hopefully you guys will sign up again and um, we will have more good discussions about it but for today that's all the time we have